Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulchre, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. It was Mary Madeline, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, and ran into the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. He has paid for our sins on the cross. And he has risen again. By the time you get to verse 1, the resurrection has already happened. But his disciples don't understand what all has happened. They, they've witnessed the, the fulfillment of prophecy and scripture, and they've witnessed the fulfillment of Christ's words, but they're not quite making the connection. And so much of Luke chapter 24 is Jesus going around and reminding his disciples of his teaching that he would have to be delivered unto the, unto the Gentiles and that he'd have to be crucified and that he would rise again the third day and he's having to remind them of all this and those angels in our passage this morning are reminding the women of that. And so much of Luke chapter 24 is Jesus going through and speaking to his disciples and reminding them of what they've seen and why they saw it and why it happened and encouraging them and uplifting them so that they can get ready to carry out the Great Commission. In this passage, we learn that Jesus had to die and be buried and rise again the third day. We learn that God wants us to understand and be reminded of the gospel. And we learn that the gospel is a wonderful thing. Now, some of these things may not be news to you, but uh, hopefully you can be reminded of these things and be blessed today. First of all, Jesus had to die for our sins and then rise again. In verse 7, the angels remind the women how Jesus said, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Jesus had to die for our sins on the cross. He had to die for our sins on the cross. He was committed to dying for our sins on the cross. In John 12, 27, I've shared this verse with you before. Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus' destination, when he came to this earth, from the moment that he was born and laid in that manger to the time that he stood in that temple at the age of 12 and spoke with those doctors of the law and those priests to the time that he called out his disciples to the travels that they did to the sermons that he preached it was all leading up to the cross that was his mission now jesus was not being forced to die for our sins on the cross nobody was making him do it but he still had to do it why did he have to die on the cross for our sins it was the only way to accomplish his mission of saving us from our yeah. from our sins John 15, 13, Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That the love of Jesus, and we studied this last week, or we studied this a couple of weeks ago, the love of Jesus motivated him to go to the cross. He wasn't being forced to go to the cross. God wasn't making him go to the cross the way that you make your children take out the trash or anything like that. Jesus was going to the cross because he wanted to go to the cross. And he wanted to go to the cross. He had to go to the cross because that was the only way to save us. He had to go because that's who he is and that's what he wanted. And there are some things that you have probably done in your life that you had to do. Not because 
anybody was making you do it, but because you knew that was the right thing to do and that was who you were and therefore you did what you had to do. Yeah. Nobody ordered you to do it, but you did it anyway. No one was making Jesus die for our sins on the cross, but he had to die in order to accomplish his mission. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Notice that. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning of our faith, and he's the end of our faith. It starts with him. He's the source. He's the foundation. He's the cornerstone. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did Jesus endure the cross? He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? The joy that was set before him was you and me. And so he wanted to die on the cross because he had to die on the cross in order for you and me to be able to to, stay, to be with him in eternity. He wanted to save us because he loves us. Christ had to die on the cross. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Christ had to die on the cross for our sins. He had to die on the cross for his kingdom. He had to die and then rise again to obtain his kingdom. A kingdom is no good without having people in it. I've, I've got a kingdom. It's over there. It's over there on, the, on that little street corner there in early. It's about a sixteenth of an acre. If I spill my coffee just right out of my kitchen window, it'll flow into the neighbor's bedroom. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very small kingdom, but it's, it's a kingdom. But you know what? I don't have much of a dominion there. <laughs> um, it's more of a democracy, really. But really what makes a kingdom is not the territory or the land, it's the people that's in it. Jesus wanted us in his kingdom. The problem is we could not enter the kingdom because our sin prevented it. Our sin stood in the way of us entering into his kingdom. So Jesus died for our sins, paid the penalty for our sins, removed our sins, so that we could enter into his kingdom. Here in the near future, Grace Point Missionary Baptist Church is going to study the book of Isaiah together. And I'm reading through Isaiah now. And if you read through the book of Isaiah, I mean, you've got to hang in there. The temptation is you get to those, those difficult passages about the Philistines and the Moabites and the Ammonites and all these other ites, and you say, well, I'm just going to, you know, there's judgment on those people. I'm just going to flip over this. Don't do that because you miss the theme of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is about how the world is sinful. You've got, and you've got two types of sinners in the world. You have the sinners that are rebelling against God, and you have the sinners who are God's people. And every, all these bad things are happening because of sin in the world. But in the book of Isaiah, God says that he's going to judge the sins of the world, but he's going to remove the sin of his people and establish his kingdom. And so you see that, that theme playing out over and over again in the book of Isaiah. The sin of the people prevents the kingdom, prevents them from going into the kingdom, but God's going to remove their sin so that they can go into the kingdom and then everything will be all right. And that's what Jesus was doing here in the book of Luke. He, in the, in the four gospels, when he fulfilled the gospel by dying on the cross for our sins, he removed or paid for the sin of the people so the people could enter into the kingdom if they will only repent, turn from their sins, and trust him as their personal savior. Isaiah 118, I, I bring that verse up a lot, right? I, I, I say how Isaiah 118 says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If you look at that verse in context, God had just laid out a list of charges against the nation of Israel, his people at that time. He had just laid out a list of charges of what all they had done wrong, of how they had turned aside, of how they had done all these things against him. And then after listing the charges, he says, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. He had removed their sins so that they could be together in the kingdom. 
And that was the point of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins so that we could be in the kingdom with him. And he wanted us in the kingdom so that we could be with him because he loves us. He wasn't just looking for minions. He has minions. I shouldn't use that word. But the Lord has the angels ministering to him and serving him and delivering his messages for him and singing his praises. So if, if it's just praise and adoration the Lord wants, he's got that with the angels. If it's just servants he wants, he's got that with the angels. He wants you in the kingdom because he loves you. How do I know that Jesus died for his kingdom so that he could assume his kingship and, and lead his people? If you look in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus tells the disciples when he's given the great commission, the first thing he tells them is all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That word power comes from the Greek word which means authority. Okay, so all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Christ had authority in Matthew chapter 28. How did he have that authority? He had that authority because he died on the cross yeah. and because he rose again. Yeah. How did he get the kingdom? He died for it. Yeah. And you take this and you, you, you take this understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a territorial kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. And the kingdom, the king is ruling by authority. He's not ruling by possession of land. He's ruling by authority. And you take that understanding of the kingdom of God, and then you go back to Matthew chapter 4, where Satan was tempting Jesus. And Satan takes him up to a high mountain and shows him the kingdoms of the world, and, and Satan says, I'll give you all these kingdoms if you'll just fall down and worship me. Satan was offering territorial kingdoms. Notice Jesus didn't deny Satan's ability to give him those kingdoms, as in the territorial kingdoms. But the Lord wasn't looking for real estate. The Lord was looking for us. And so he died for us. Those territorial kingdoms that, that Satan was offering him, the Lord would not have his authority over us in those kingdoms. Now, he could, he could have ruled us, he could have made laws, but the second we died, we would no longer be under his authority because we would be under God's authority because he wouldn't have died for our sins at that point if he had accepted Satan's offer. But Jesus refused Satan's offer because he was not looking for territorial kingdoms. He was looking for his spiritual kingdom where we could be with him in that kingdom for eternity. Yeah. Satan's offer in Matthew chapter 4 did not even appeal to him. There's a lesson to be learned from that, by the way. Satan oftentimes will offer you a shortcut, but the end result of that shortcut is not going to be the blessing that God had in store for you. So, so whenever you see a shortcut to get to something, get-rich-quick schemes, never, I've never seen a get-rich-quick scheme work out unless Exxon finds oil in your backyard. It's probably not going to happen. And if it, did, if it does happen, you're blessed. And I'm not going to fault you for selling oil off of your property, but... But by and large, blessings come through our faith in the Lord Amen. and by our acting out on that faith. And there's usually a lot of hard work involved in that, but that's where our blessings come from. Jesus had to die and rise again because that was the only way to save us. It was the only way to spare us from God's wrath. It was the only way to give us eternal life. It was the only way to get us into his kingdom. And it was the only way to get us to be with him in eternity. He had to die for our sins, remove our sins, pay the penalty for our sins, and then he had to rise again so that he could sit on that throne, so that he could rule and reign, so that he could have his kingdom, so he could assume the position. And that's what Romans 5.10 is referring to. And Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Because he lives, because he lives, we will enter into that kingdom with him for eternity. Amen. But he had to die in order to accomplish that. So Jesus had to die for our sins on the cross and be buried and rise again. Not because anybody was forcing him, but because that was the only way to accomplish his mission of saving us and establishing his kingdom. God wants us to know and he wants us to understand the gospel. These women in verse 1, they were taking their spices to the tomb. 
and they've been working on these for quite a while now jesus was was uh, crucified and they they ordered his body to be taken down before the uh before the high sabbath day and between the high sabbath day and the regular sabbath day there's a day in the middle of that called the day of spices and so you couldn't prepare your spices on the sabbath day and in fact if you look in uh, chapter 23 and verse 56 it says, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So these women were following the commandments of God. And so they didn't have time to do the spices and the ointments and basically their version of embalming Jesus the day that he was buried because they had to get him down off the cross. And, and Joseph did this, uh, Joseph of Arimathea did this, but they had to get him down off of the cross and into the tomb before sundown that day. And so they did that. So they didn't have time to prepare the spices and the ointments. Then they had to rest that Sabbath day. And then that next, the day after the Sabbath day, now is the time that they have to prepare those spices and those ointments. And so they spend the day doing that. And then the next Sabbath day comes along. And then they have the, the first day of the week when they can finally go out there and tend to the body of Jesus. And so these women had made this a high priority. And when you look at them on the first day of the week, verse 1 says, very early in the morning, this was their first priority. So Jesus was a priority to them. They were devoted. And then in verses 2 and 3, you read how they arrive at the tomb and they find Jesus missing. And how do you think these women are feeling? I mean, everything that they have been through this week and now this. They're traumatized. They're perplexed. They're confused. And then in verses 4 through 7, those two men in shining garments arrive and, and remind them that Jesus told them that he was going to die, that he was going to be buried, and that he was going to rise again the third day. Now, we believe these men were angels. The Bible doesn't explicitly say they were angels here in the book of Luke, but we believe they're angels. That word angel comes from a Greek word, angelos, which, which is a word that was used quite commonly back in those days. It was a messenger. Now, when you say the word angel, you're thinking of a heavenly body or a spiritual being or, or you know, you're, you're thinking of, the, you're thinking of, of one of God's cherubim, seraphims. That's what you're thinking of when you're thinking of an angel. But an angel is a messenger. An angel is a messenger. The angels are God's messengers. They are his servants. The Bible says they are ministering spirits. And so these two men in these, in these shining clothes are there. Why are they there? They are there to deliver a message on behalf of God. And that message to those women was that Jesus, this was all part of the plan. Remember, he told you he was going to have to go to Jerusalem to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, to uh, be crucified and to rise again on the third day. That was the message that they delivered to those women. God wanted those women to know what had happened. You think God was surprised by the fact that those women showed up on, at that graveside early that morning? No, he knew they were going to be there. He had already dispatched his messengers. He had already dispatched his angels. When those, two, when those ladies show up to that graveside, y'all tell them what is going on. Y'all give them this message. God wanted them to understand God wants us to know and understand the, the gospel. And that's why, the, that's why God defined the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. This is basic theology. This is, the, this is the foundational principle of the Bible. If you don't understand 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, you will have a hard time properly interpreting the rest of the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, Paul says, I delivered unto you that which I first of all, I, for he, he says, I delivered unto you that which I received, and this is the important part, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. That is the definition of the gospel, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. I am amazed at how many people don't know the gospel. 
You ask them what the gospel is, and they'll tell you it's the Bible. They'll tell you it's the good news. They'll tell you it's how to be saved. How to be saved is a good is a, is good news, but that's not God's definition of the of the gospel. God's definition of the gospel is how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, how he was buried, and how he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is not only defined in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 4, but it is prophesied and its fulfillment is written about countless times in the Bible. There are countless prophecies about the sufferings of Christ, about how he would how he would die, how he would take away the sins of the world, how he would rise again. Isaiah 53 is a very popular passage dealing with the death of the, of the Lord, the death of Christ, the death of God's righteous servant for the sin or the iniquity or the transgression of the many. It is illustrated in Scripture in many ways. From Noah building the ark, you know, the ark was a picture of Christ, and Peter wrote about that. To Abraham being prepared to, sacri to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, to the sacrifices in the Old Testament, the, the Passover lamb, and Jesus fulfilled that on Passover. It is prophesied, it is illustrated so many times in scriptures that not only do we have that, but we have preachers and teachers and pastors and ministers as uh, spoken about in Ephesians chapter 4 that expound the gospel unto us, that teach us about it. And I have men that I look to that teach me. And I went to seminary where I had a group of men that taught me about the gospel. I, I listen to the radio, and sometimes you get a preacher on the radio that knows the gospel and he preaches it. God wants us to know and understand the gospel, so he has brought all these things into our lives. Yes. God wants us to know and understand the gospel, how Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He wants us to know this. He wants us to understand it. He wants us to internalize it, and he wants us to be reminded of it. These ladies in Luke chapter 24 had been through a lot that week. They had seen their Lord crucified. This man had taken them from the gutters of society, and they weren't exactly rich and famous at this point, but he had taken them out of the dark places where they were in their lives, and he had lifted them up and into the light. He had changed their lives forever, and they would never forget that. And their Savior, their spiritual Savior, but also their Savior in this life, the man who turned them around, they saw him killed in one of the most gruesome ways you can think of. And unlike the men... They weren't running away. They, they, they were there, and they saw it. At least Mary Madeline and Joanna and Mary, uh, they were there. They, uh, Salome, I believe the Bible says, was there. But, but they were there, and they saw it. And then they're going through all this, the fallout afterwards, and trying to get the spices together, and everything is just falling apart in their lives. And they go to the Lord's tomb, and he's not there. And so they've lost sight of what the Lord had been teaching about his death, burial, and resurrection. But the angels reminded them. Yes. In our lives, we can get pretty hectic in our lives, can't we? Yes. Whether it's work-related, or whether it's family-related, whether it's situation-related, things can get to going so fast, so hard, so bad, or maybe so good. Uh, things just get to going all around you, and you're having trouble figuring out which way is up and keeping up, and you're tired, and you're worn out, and and you're confused and you really would like nothing better than to be able to get out in the country for a few weeks and not have to deal with anything and and things keep happening and you lose sight of the gospel and you forget that you are purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ it doesn't mean you lose your salvation but you can lose your joy you can lose your peace you can lose your comfort we need to slow down and take a look at the bigger picture God wants us to know and understand and be reminded of the gospel. And then in verse 12, I don't know, sometimes I have to wonder about the disciples. I, I have to wonder about them, but at the same time, I'm not sure I would have done any better. But in, ver in verses 10 and 11, 
the women go back to the disciples, to the eleven, and to the others that are there with them, and they tell the disciples about Jesus being resurrected. And verse 11, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. They're just idle tales. Josh comes and tells me things. And he tells me about dragons and dinosaurs and and cartoon characters and he is very vivid in his imagination and he's getting to be quite a good storyteller. And but you know what? They're idle tales. And so if I'm busy, if I'm not busy, I'm listening to him and I'm qu- really. But if I'm busy, I'm sitting there saying, "Yeah, Josh." Okay, Josh, yeah, mm -hmm, really interesting. And and his story is just going in one ear and out the other ear, and one day I'm going to regret that. But they're they're idle tales. They're kid stories. And that's how these disciples were treating the women telling them about the resurrection, except for Peter in verse 12. Verse 12, Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. So Peter actually took the step, and other other gospels, uh, the other gospels tell us John went with him. The book of John tells us that the other disciple went with him. John never referred to himself. He never said, and I went with him. He said, whenever you see John refer to himself, he either refers to himself as the other disciple or he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so that's, there's a message in that. But, but Peter actually gets the gumption to get up and go have a look. And he looks, ran to the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves. You know what that means? That means that these women aren't making this up. Because if the body of Jesus was stolen, they wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap him and leave the linen clothes there in the tomb. I got to, uh, History Channel did something very unusual a couple of months ago. They actually showed something about history. Here lately it's been reality shows. But they actually showed a documentary on Lincoln, on Abraham Lincoln's body after he was assassinated and how they embalmed him and how they transported him back to, uh, back to Illinois and how these, this group of people tried to steal the body of Lincoln. And they didn't, they didn't succeed in doing that. But these men who tried to steal Lincoln's body, they didn't try to open up his casket and pull him out of there and take off when they were going to take the casket too. You see, because they have to get in and out of there quickly. If you're stealing a body, you don't take the time to undress the body. This is morbid, isn't it? But, this, this, but, this, this, but the, reason, the reason I'm bringing this to mind is because the Scripture goes so far as to tell us that the linen clothes laid by themselves, they were there. So that means his body wasn't stolen. And I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it may be the book of John. It's one of the other Gospels that records how the, uh, the handkerchief, the, the face cloth, was folded up and placed over in the corner. Thieves don't fold things up and place them in the corners. Have you ever had your house broken into? I haven't. I'm thankful for that. But when they do, they don't put everything back nicely once they got what they wanted to. They tear the place up, and then they take off out of there. They're liable to leave your front door wide open. Jesus' body wasn't stolen. He was resurrected. When Peter sees those linen clothes, he knows that Jesus has come back to life. and He walked out of that tomb. And he departed, in verse 12, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. That word wondering doesn't mean you're asking a question. It means you are amazed. It's amazement. He is in awe in wonder wow here Peter thought that it was all over here Peter thought that all was lost and Jesus has come back and now Peter's trying to wrap his mind around that the fact that the only begotten son of God would come to earth to die for our sins so that he could have us in his kingdom should just completely amaze us the song Amazing Grace that we sing for our invitation, it's, it's what it's about. The grace is amazing. The man who wrote that song 
was just amazed that a guy who had done the horrific things that he had done could be saved, that Christ died for him, that God extended his grace to him. And when I look at some of the things I've done in my life, it's amazing. Not only that God would save me, but that he'd, that he'd let me stand before you and, and, and preach this morning. It's amazing. That's amazing grace. We should be amazed that he paid for our sins and that he saved us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we should be eagerly watching for the next phase in God's plan. We are looking at the very real possibility that his return could come in our lifetimes. Now, I used to say, I used to say, you, those of you in the seniors class, uh, y'all, y'all may not see it in your lifetime, but I'll see it in my lifetime. Y'all may see it in your lifetime. You may very well see it in your lifetime. Our world cannot sustain what it's doing much longer. And I know that every preacher <laughs> since Jesus ascended to be at the right hand of the Father, every preacher has said that that this world cannot sustain what it's doing, that Christ is going to come back soon because of what's going on. But let me tell you, I was born in the late 70s, and just in my short 34 years on this planet, I have the world now is a completely different world than it was when I was born. And I remember how it was different back then, and I see how it's different now, and I see the direction it's going. And that direction it's going it's turning the wrong way. It's turning against God. And it is turning that way and headed faster toward the speed toward destruction is increasing. We cannot sustain that much longer. And so we know that sometime soon the Lord is returning. But we need to be confidently looking forward to that. The book of Isaiah, there's a song called The Song of Confidence. After God expressed his desire to execute judgment upon the world, Isaiah sang a song of confidence. Why did he sing a song of confidence? Because he knew that he was one of the redeemed. Yes. So while we're looking at the possibility of one day seeing the return of Christ and the things that are going to happen in this world leading up to that, we can sing a song of confidence knowing that he, we are his redeemed. And that that wrath that he is executing upon the world is not going to be executed upon us, but that we're going to be received into his kingdom. You think about all this, everything that has been recorded here in this passage in Luke chapter 24, and just how amazing and, and how awesome, the word awesome means being filled with awe and wonder. It's not a surfer word. The surfers borrowed it back in the 1990s, but the word has literal meaning to be filled with awe and wonder. And you look at what that does, and you look at the gospel and how it is filled with awe and wonder. And that should motivate us to think about Jesus, to keep him in mind. And so when you go forward this week and you're doing your daily routine, and there are daily routines, and God wants us to follow our daily routines. He wants us to do what he has put us in the place to do. But while you do that, keep the gospel in mind. Or as that old song goes, take the name of Jesus with you. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us, Father, for your gospel, for your, for your welcome that you have uh, extended unto us and to, and to your kingdom, Father. We pray that you would forgive us for our sins, that you would uh, guide us in the direction that you'd have us to go, that you'd give us guidance as a church as we make decisions on what we can do for your kingdom here in Brownwood, Father, whether it be building a new church facility to be able to welcome more people into uh, worship services, Father, whether it be outreach projects, whether it be proclaiming your gospel and your name and the name of our Lord in the streets, Father, whatever, whatever your will is, Father, we pray that you'd make it known to us and that you would guide us in that direction that you'd have us to go. Father, we ask you to be with us as we go forward from here today, that you'd help us to each have a blessed Sunday, Father, a blessed day of rest and worship and that you bring us all back here safely tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.